My group was originally just players from our local area in Ohio. Then, throughout the past two years, we've gone online and added a bunch of new players who have ended up being Canadian for some reason. We started with one who brought a friend, and DM started adding in more. I guess Canadian gamers are like potato chips. Oh, sorry. Cause you can't have just one. We're about half Ohio gamers and half Canadians at this point. We gel well, and it's a good group. We had the following conversation in our Discord last night. Canadian gamer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I meant to mention to you guys. I met another gamer from Ohio in another group. Me, thinking. Oh, that's awesome. I wonder if they're from the area. Maybe they'll want to join in. Canadian gamer. He was like a literal Nazi. He had swastika tattoos and stuff. I don't game with him anymore, of course. Shut up, that's the best Canadian accent you've heard so far. Every Ohio gamer. Face palm and groan of embarrassment for our state. So yeah, safe to say the guy mentioned will never join our group. Yikes. Well, it's a good thing Ohio doesn't exist. <laughs> right, guys? Wait, it's all Ohio? Always has been, little Jimmy. Always has been. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. Before we begin today's video, first we have a word from our sponsor, Apotheosis. Man, I sure love being a paladin, but I hate that I cannot have a pet tiger bestowed upon me by my god to smite my enemies with. You can't do that? Oh, that sucks. Wait, you can? Of course I can. My player plays Apotheosis, where I am unbound in the tight constrictions of D&D 5th Edition's class system, and am basically free to be whatever I want. So you're saying you're not forced to take Peerless, Athlete, and Aura of Alacrity because being an Oath of Glory Paladin is part of my character? Precisely. I only take the features I want after I level up my skills. By doing the things I want to do. You should try it sometime. But, but what about combat? My player plays me because I can fell many a heretic under the weight of my broadsword. Is the combat robust? Challenging? I admit, I'm quite tired of my player taking 10 minute long turns in an 8 round combat when all he's going to make me do is SMITE! It's as fast and deadly as can be while still being open enough for you to give your holy monologues after each enemy you slay. Deus Volt! Okay, calm down there, golden boy. How do I convince my player to try Apotheosis? He's stingy and spends all of his money commissioning art of me SMITING MY ENEMIES! Well, I'm glad you asked. I've got a little birdie here who can help you out with that. Did someone say discount code? That's right. You can try Apotheosis now for 20% off by following the link in my description. Making the game under $15 for a digital PDF, and just in time for the holidays. And the best part about going digital is that unlike your copy of Strixhaven, which is stuck on a freighter in the epicenter of the Bermuda Triangle, this book will actually show up. But Crow, you might say, are you in the game? And to that I'd say, how the hell did you escape from Ohio, Jimmy? And yes, if you send the message Crow's Perch, to any of Apotheosis' socials like their Facebook or Twitter, you can still receive a special profile for a Crow's Perch-themed NPC. Thank you to Apotheosis for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get started. In today's RPG horror story, what happens when a DM makes you roll for everything? Or when DMs make your rolls meaningless? What happens when a DM does both of those things? and also makes combat unnecessarily difficult for seemingly no reason. Today, we'll find out in the tale of Jay, the DM who punishes his players for playing his game. So without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive right into this story. First, a little background. I used to frequent a local game store because of my partaking of the cardboard crack that is trading card games. At the time of this story, I was already playing and running games in 5th edition for some friends, and the local game store had its own West Marches games on Monday night. A few of my local game store mates started looking around for home games. Enter Jay. 
Jay had never really played much D&D before, but really loved the idea of it, particularly being the dungeon master. He had gotten himself a DM guide, and was really into the idea of running a game. He had his own setting all thought up, and a few players of varying experience who were interested. One of them said it was really fun, and that I should come along. Story, banter, and challenge. Sounded good. I came out of curiosity, and because it was a chance to be a player for a change. Players are as follows. Princess. A homebrew witch class. Character was a princess in setting lore. Lunk. A barbarian slash ranger. Think Link from The Legend of Zelda, but angry. Spark. An arcane trickster rogue. Loki vibes. K. A half-elf druid. Loves critical role. Edgy. An assassin rogue. Had never played D&D before, but liked Elder Scrolls. Strike one. The first session. Jay tells us all that the adventure is set in his own world. There are two great kingdoms that are at war, and we are adventurers caught in the middle. There is only one side that uses magic, and the setting is very low magic and feudal. We may have to take a side eventually, but there apparently will be political intrigue as well as swords and sorcery. He also says to us that it's going to be challenging, and difficult in both combat and roleplay. Sounds like my cup of tea. So I rolled up a wizard to level 2. A high elf illusionist had an idea of playing him as a bit of a self-serving asshole, like Edwin of Thay from Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. I was determined to do the whole evil character in a neutral to good party thing. Thought it'd be cool story-wise, and Jay seemed to be on board. Wrote up a whole backstory and such. The party find me locked in a cell, in the dungeon. And the party and I have to get through the first few encounters until we get to the boss. An orc war chief. As I said, I'm usually a DM, and I know that the challenge rating of one of these boys is about a 4. But it's cool, because Jay knows we are level 2, and wouldn't be running the creature fully as written. Right? Wrong. I cast Magic Missile on it, and it immediately charges towards me. First attack gets through the shield, but damage-wise is a low roll. Gets me down to one hit point. Second attack is a 19 on the die, which I'm informed is a crit. And because I'm at such low health, once damage is counted, kills me instantly. No unconsciousness or death saves. Just dead. Because it dealt over double my max hit points. So I just have to sit there for the rest of the session. K and Spark are experienced players and are looking at me like I've been cheated. So not only did he run a creature with minions that is way beyond the party's capabilities, but he also made it stronger by giving it three fighter levels. So it's that kind of game, huh? Jay approaches me after and says he's sorry that it worked out that way, but he hopes I'll roll something else and come back next week. He's going to speed level the party to improve balance. He clearly has no idea what he's doing, but... I give him the benefit of the doubt. I leave it a few sessions, but this time I roll Ragnak, a half-orc vengeance paladin. I make him huge, dumb, and completely lovable to the rest of the party. Did somebody say himbo? Patrick, I don't think himbo is a real word. Come on, you know, I himbo, you himbo, he, she, me, himbo. I get him 20 strength, a glaive, the Polar Master and Sentinel feats, and proceed to destroy a boss that he puts in front of the party as a trial by combat thing. He sets it up with pit fighting rules, where my opponent and I roll initiative every round. But thanks to Polar Master and Sentinel, I'm getting three attacks to his two, and that's when he actually even gets to melee me. On top of this, Spark and Princess are aiding me by quietly spellcasting, from the stands. Jay looks like he'd love nothing more than to kill Ragnak, but because of the way I've made him, and made the party love him, he knows the table would be an open revolt if he did. In the sessions that follow, we get nowhere near the two warring kingdoms. We are seemingly out in the frontier lands, and all of that political intrigue we were told about? Yeah, 
that's going on somewhere else, while we drag ourselves through mountains and fight Ettons, unable to keep track of our movements or make a map because Jay hasn't really made one yet. I start to get a lurch in my stomach. The game continues off and on until Strike 2, the spooky one-shot. So Halloween is coming up, and Jay wants to do a special one-off session that'll not be connected to the main story. He wants to branch out and use some survival horror themes. So I bring Ragnak along. When the session starts, we are told that we are locked in a wooden cage with none of our items. Everything's gone. We make investigation checks to find something to jimmy the lock with. Nothing. Princess casts a spell to try and damage the cage. Nada. I attempt to brawn my way through the wooden bars. Doesn't work. Jay says that after we try all of these things, seemingly pointlessly, the door on the cage just swings open. We then make our way down the corridors. Still no items. We trigger some traps, which we have no idea are there, and that we can't disarm because the rogues have no thieves' tools. We are then informed that there is a death knight chasing us, and we do not have time to be searching every room. So, we move on, because at our current level, the death knight can TPK us within two rounds. K, Spark, and I, as experienced players, know this. The dungeon is a series of branching corridors, with sections that close behind us, so we can't backtrack. Somehow, this does not impede the Death Knight, though, who is always one or two rooms behind. And Jay takes great pains to remind us of this. Edgy falls down a pit trap and is just out of the game for a while, as he falls to a lower section of the dungeon. We can't follow down the pit, because we have no rope, and as soon as we start thinking about doing something else, we are told that the door to this section starts rattling. So, we have to move on. People are visibly and audibly frustrated, and the session kind of peters out. Nobody is enjoying themselves. Jay is frustrated because we didn't reach the end of the one-shot he made, and the players are hating it because we literally cannot do anything. There were perhaps half a dozen rolls between all of us the entire game. I say afterward to Spark and Lunk that I'm done, but they say to think about it and come back, because they like my character. I have a chat with Jay about what railroading means and he seems to take it in. Nonetheless, I have a couple weeks off and contemplate whether I'm gonna bother continuing. Fast forward a few weeks and a couple of the players are messaging me, saying that it's gotten good and that we are about to enter a cavern with a powerful magical item inside. As stated, the campaign has been really low magic up till this point. When I come back though, I am met with Strike 3, The Wall. So I am persuaded to come back for a session, to give this one more chance. And true enough, Jay has a large enemy settlement mocked up. He's clearly been doing some reading, because he's got some environmental effects and three-dimensional battlefields going on. We pass through the enemy camp and into the cavern, navigating our way through slowly and carefully to dodge traps and find loot. Then we are told we find an exit to the outside, bordering the sea, and a huge wall-like sea cliff rises up before us. There is an opening near the top, and it becomes obvious that we are meant to climb up. Ragnak's time to shine, I think to myself. Ragnak will take rope and climb, then others climb behind once Ragnak gets to top. I say in character. I was doing the whole third person thing. And I say to Jay that I want to use my superior strength to climb up, run the rope to the top so the rest of the party can climb up easier. He frowns, suddenly annoyed. Uh, sure. Make an athletics check. So Ragnak does, and he passes. So I start saying that when I get to the top, I'm going to wrap it round my waist and grip the rock so that the party can- You've only climbed up 15 feet. Roll athletics again. He had me roll athletics every 15 feet while the rest of the table watched. If I failed any checks, I failed only two, he would have me make a dexterity saving throw where if I failed, I would take damage from falling rocks 
or slide down the cliff face. Ragnak's climb went on for 20 minutes in real life, and the party and I were bored as flock. When I finally got Ragnak to the top, everyone else managed to climb up fine. Because the experienced players and I argued that because Ragnak was at the top holding the rope, he was technically assisting the other climbers, giving them advantage. Jay wanted them all struggling up the cliff like I did. After we got to the top, the session ended. Everyone was pissed, including Jay, who had wanted the cliff climb to be this dangerous, death-defying obstacle for the whole group, and my actions had ruined that. So he wanted at least one character to feel the difficulty he had intended. I told him later in private that I wasn't prepared to be in a game where the DM punishes players for solving problems. I'm not here as a player to thwart the DM, but the DM should not be there to kill players. Never came back. But I did hear later that the game fell apart because the players started leaving after I did. The last straw was apparently when he openly used homophobic slurs towards Princess's player, who is male and gay, and Jay had a meltdown because nobody cared about his campaign world, which we had never seen or experienced any of the world building for at all. In short, remember that no D&D is better than bad D&D. And that guy DMs are so much worse than that guy players. If you're in a game with a DM like Jay, remember that you owe it to your own enjoyment of this hobby to find a better table. Couldn't have said it better myself. To any DM running the game for the first time, remember this golden rule. You are not the player's enemy. In my personal opinion, a DM's role is that of a referee for a set of rules you've defined in your game, setting, and table. You're there to enforce consistency in your game and to facilitate cool situations for them to solve, especially in a game like Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, where we rely more on rulings than rules. Jay seemed to struggle to understand difficulty, and I get it. Difficulty is hard to gauge. I see so many stories where people say they want a grim, dark, serious campaign that's difficult and challenging, and then they just throw a lich at a party of level 3s. As a GM, you're gonna have to do a little bit of game design, and unfortunately difficulty is hard to gauge in games like D&D, since there is always an inherent arbitrariety due to roles. But we can make educated guesses with things like difficulty tables for DCs for roles, or a monster's challenge rating. Also keep in mind, you don't need to roll for everything. Oh, are you gonna climb something? Oh, maybe you should roll. Oh wait, you have a rope? And it's firmly secured? No, maybe we shouldn't. It's that easy. Do what makes sense. But anyway, those are today's stories, and these are my thoughts, and I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about today's stories in the comments down below. And as we begin to close today's video, I'd like to start off with Art of the Week. Art of the Week! This week's Art of the Week is by Doodle Poodle on Twitter, who goes by John Boy on their DeviantArt page. He has created incredible art pieces for a webcomic series surrounding one of their characters. Inspired by members of the RPG horror story community, including myself. And so, here is the crow, telling Angela, the protagonist of these stories, of the wretched and vile tales he's heard from the distant land of Reddit. You can find a link to their webcomic, Tales from the Tables, in the description down below. This is some incredible fan art, and I've been really proud of what the community's been coming up with over these past months. And speaking of the community, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our patrons. Our Burb, Reuven Gritters, our Counts of Quills, Gibber Woods, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Sawyer Rankin, Kooky Spooks, Rikus, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. And next up, our Barons of Beaks, Wormy. Who am I again? Matthew Moquini, Vincent, Den of the Drake, Mick Yeatley, and Anya. And last but not least are Dukes of Feathers, Sean Gill, Stevie, Doc Salty 96 and Acroth. Thank you so much for your support. And I had a really wild time with some of you in our most recent Patreon game. It was awesome stuff. Thank you once again to Apotheosis for sponsoring today's video. And also a special thank you to William SRD and Crit Crab. Stay clawsome. And with all of that out of the way, 
I will see you guys next time. As the crow flies. <laughs>